Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to also thank the organizers of the meeting for this invitation opportunity to come here. Uh, half of my presentation has always, always already been done, so uh, I hope I'm not going to take much of your time uh, beyond the 20 minutes. Um, so uh, starting with, uh, with what has been um, mentioned uh, about this disease and the systemic uh, th therapy for pancreatic cancer is really the way to go, obviously. We got into what we can do in terms of surgery, uh, radiation therapy, we have made major improvements, but in a disease where systemic failures are so common, even after resection, let alone patients who present with advanced disease, we really have to, uh, uh, to see some advances happening there. A disease that uh, also has uh, frequent mutations in the KRAS, and also in tumor suppressor genes, which also create problems because of the drugability of these uh, molecules and pathways. Now, we talked about uh, uh, systemic treatment when it comes to cytotoxic drugs, and Margaret did an excellent job in introducing us to the two major combinations that we have at this time, which we use as platforms for our uh, treatments when we come to adding experimental agents. But if you look at those four graphs here, they represent work done over the past, uh, over the past maybe two decades, and here I will say successful work, successful phase three trials, only four of them in the uh, frontline setting. You can see that we're getting incremental benefits. They are modest, uh, and in some case, uh, one, one case, in, the term, in case of the uh, lotanib, is considered to be a marginal benefit, which has over the years resulted in very few people using the drug uh, in the day-to-day -day treatment. And you can see that these are modest steps that we need to improve on. Not only that, our major improvements, if these are called major improvements, are in cytotoxic drugs rather than uh, target agents. Another example of a cytotoxic drug uh, improvement is a phase three trial, Napoli, that was presented here last year. And this is looking at the liposomal iron tecan, which, uh, which the way uh, the pharmacokinetics are and the biodistribution, they favor uh, a better distribution to the tumor with um, with lesser toxicity, and, and in the second line setting in patients with gemcitabine treatment failures, we see that there is benefit from adding the drug. Again, a modest benefit. Uh, interestingly, the drug itself did not improve over five a few when single uh, agent activities were, um, were, uh, were compared. This drug is still not approved by the FDA. It's in the process. And also there is uh, obviously an interest and, uh, and also planning on the part of the company to move it into the frontline treatment. Now, uh, this slide has been shown maybe twice before, and Margaret uh, alluded to the, to the increase in the uh, pancreatic cancer mortality that's expected by 2030, something that's really uh, very frightening, and therefore we are very much concerned about how do we really go about improving our systemic treatments. And uh, I see a lot of young people in the audience, and I think this is an exciting time for you to really take on an interest in this disease, because we do have a, a improvement in, the, in, uh, in our understanding of the biology. We know more about the targets that we have to go after. You saw this uh, nice picture, which uh, uh, Manny showed from an article he, uh, he wrote with, uh, with Dr. Garrido as a review article. And really, we have a number of targets that we may go after. But the question is, why aren't we really um, making major steps forward? And this, these are things which I'd like to discuss in the next 15 minutes. However, there are challenges, and I call them challenges, not problems or obstacles or barriers, because we really have to go around them. Uh, they, we know about the uh, drug resistance, which is fairly uh, frequent, whether de novo or acquired in this disease. We talk about the stroma all the time as a barrier, but then again, we talk about it as a barrier, probably it has more biology than, than uh, we think we know about. We need to improve on that. The microenvironment uh, as a whole is a complex one, and there are multiple gene mutations we talked about and the non-drugability of certain mutations, especially the tumor suppressor genes. And sadly, this is a disease until now, we don't have really a good biomarker. We have semi-biomarkers. In serum CA99, we, we talk about C-reactive protein, but none of them really go to the heart of the tumor and knowing some genetic abnormalities that we can go after. And in fact, we have to be excused of, and we not feel very sad about it because so far we haven't really identified uh, driver gene mutations that we had like in other cancers. 
frequent mutations, you've seen this slide before, uh, average of 60 or plus, and then we have the issue of uh, uh, redundant uh, signaling si uh, pathways, crosstalk and all that, so our attempts to try to add a single targeted agent to chemotherapy really is very, very much uh, uh, a, 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 a difficult one to expect that will make any major improvement. And the microenvironment, the dense fibro fibrosis we see in the tumor, and also now moving into the immune, uh, immune components of the microenvironment that we're trying to improve uh, at least with certain uh, pharmacological uh, manipulations. Now, because we are in the microenvironment, I just want to go over the angiogenesis. The VEGF, VEGFR pathway has been targeted in at least three large uh, randomized trials and all failed. Bevacizumab, aflibrozib, and axitinib. And we think that uh, this is explained partly or largely by the fact that pancreatic tumors are typically hypovascular. Well, hypovascular tumors also create other opportunities, and one of the things which we're looking at, obviously, as you know, is having a drug that is preferentially activated by hypoxic cells that tend to have overexpression of cytochrome reductase, which is in, to some drugs an activating step in metabolism. We have cytochrome P450, the one we know of, but also we have cytochrome reductase, which is also can be an activating enzyme. And here, alkylating agent TH302, which is uh, preferentially uh, activated in hypoxic environment. And there are studies, uh, and I checked on this last night actually, with small numbers of patients showing that in pancreatic cancer, relatively, relative to other tumors, you see more of the tumors having hypoxia. And there was a randomized phase two trial, a pilot trial, that indicated the the possible activity was the drug combined with gemcitabine, which quickly led to a large phase three trial called Maestro that is now completed, and we hope we'll find some results at the end of this year or next year. So again, this might open up opportunities to use this drug in different settings where we can combine with other drugs or in situations where we can uh, link it to some form of imaging or something that help, can help us select patients who can benefit for this treatment. The, my expectation with the phase three trial is not going to be a, a huge step forward in terms of a difference in median survival, but again, if we have some activity, then we may be able to modify that in, and select patients according to that. We talked about uh, stroma, and you heard about the hyaluron as a, as a barrier for drug delivery multiple times today, and I, I'm just going to go over this very quickly. And, uh, and again, the, the initial thought was more than 80% of the tumors will express the hyaluron, but now we think it's closer to 40% based on the initial, and I have to warn you, very small data set we have at this point in time. And again, there is uh, some thought that this is really responsible for the poor drug delivery and also the increase in the tension of the pressure within the tumor uh, environment. However, I'm not sure if this is really the, the only explanation or the simplistic way of thinking that you're just trying to, to remove a barrier and let, the, uh, and let the drugs go in. In fact, it may, be, and well, it may well be that there are other biological issues related to degrading the hyaluron, which we don't know of as yet. In, in preclinical models, we've seen it, but we've seen a lot of things in preclinical models, so we really have to wait for the larger trials. And in fact, there are two randomized trials, and this is a bit unique because this is a, a target agent which is, which is being tested with two different platforms. One of them is the Falferinox, and the other one is the Gemnapacataxel, which you heard about. Both studies are currently ongoing. Now, unlike the uh, how was I sponsored trial where low molecular weight heparin is being used? In our study at SWAG, we're using aspirin as a daily aspirin as a way of trying to reduce the uh, incidence of the clotting. Uh, certainly, we didn't have that much money to buy um, low molecular weight heparin for every patient. Therefore, we decided to do the aspirin. And so far, we've been doing okay. So hopefully, that will continue as such. And, and you saw these results. I'm not really going to um, discuss this again. Now, talking about the stroma and the microenvironment and uh, inflammatory cells, et cetera, all of us who treat pancreatic cancer, we come across patients who come to us who feel unwell, they lose weight, cachexia, muscle weakness, uh, leukocytosis, uh, low albumin, et cetera, and we have come across those patients and they have elevated CRP levels. This is the inflammatory syndrome, cytokine release, and nowadays we, we think that we may be able to 
to help those patients by the use of drugs that target, in this particular case, the JAK-STAT pathway, which is, again, a, a, a pathway in the li in line of the cytokine activity. So ruxolotinib is a JAK-1-2 inhibitor, and this is already approved by the FDA for myelofibrosis and uh, polysathenia vera. And this drug has gone into a, 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 a randomized phase 2 trial in patients with uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer. Uh, this study that has already been um, uh, presented and it's, uh, it's in, in the press uh, shows that uh, if you treat all patients, you may not see an added benefit. We're using capecitabine in patients with, uh, uh, with progressing on gemcitabine. However, if you select the patients based on uh, the C CRP level, and, and in this case they use the cutoff point of 13, then you see a benefit by adding the ruxolotinib. So this is uh, something which really went straight to two phase, th uh, phase three trials and currently being tested and using a CRP cutoff point of 10. Now one of the things is that sometimes you can look at a patient and say, I know what the CRP will be, it will be very high. And, uh, and some patients really score CRPs of 85, 100, et cetera. But to be honest with you, the majority of the patients we're testing were, were part of the trial, we're not really getting even the 10. So, so this is going to be a smaller number of patients than initially predicted will be having elevated CRP levels. And patients who will have very high levels of CRP may not be even a candidate for a clinical trial or any treatment. So something to keep in mind. The other interesting thing about this study is that there's weight gain. And I'm hoping that we can prove that the weight gain was indeed from muscle, uh, muscle gain. But uh, we, we have to see the, uh, the, the details of this trial. Because the IL-6 and the inflammatory cascades also work in the, in the muscles, and, and maybe the ruxolotinib is really uh, helping out there. Now, you will say, well, this is a target agent. Maybe this will be a good target treatment that shows improvement, and we, I've been saying cytotoxics have been the major thing. But it also could be that this treatment is really helping patients to get more cytotoxic treatment by making them feel better. So we're still looking for that real big bang in target therapy. Well, this might be a drug of interest to you. Uh, necuparinib, and I, and I have some problems sometimes pronouncing those complex names, but certainly an interesting drug, a multi-target agent. Uh, it targets a number of uh, uh, targets, P-selectin, CXR4, CDF, SDF1, uh, VEGF, and also heparinase. And, uh, and this, uh, this uh, compound has been tested in phase one setting, and you see on the left, at least the left to me, uh, the, uh, the results of the uh, single phase one trial, and uh, certain of interest, and it was uh, presented in, in ASCO, and now the study uh, of the randomization between uh, uh, randomized patients to uh, gemnaptax plus minus this compound is ongoing. So a very interesting compound to see what will happen. Again, um, really uh, uh, using a multi-target agent, so that might make it a bit different than me saying a single target is not really going to make it in this disease. Immunotherapy, and I'm not an expert in immunotherapy, but, but certainly within the complex environment of the pancreas, it's, it's, it's interesting to see what we can do. So with my simple-minded clinician, we have to have the T cells there. You have to have plenty of them. And I don't know if we see that many T cells in, in patients with pancreatic cancer tumors. But also you have to have less of the uh, bad T cells or the Tregs and, and, and so on. So. Uh, so we, we, you heard about this trial, which is the GVAX uh, uh, cyclophosphamide plus minus the Listeria monocytogenes, and here targeting the mesothelin uh, to create the boost. And we have uh, a, a study that is currently uh, ongoing phase three trial, but this was based on this pilot trial, which showed improvement in patients who received uh, the cyclophosphamide GVAX and the CRS207. And, and you can see that the median survival was improved from four months to six months. Uh, and again, for the first time, we saw something in, uh, using immunotherapy in this disease, which is very encouraging. And uh, this is the trial which is currently ongoing, which is again of interest to see what it will show. What about check, uh, check one, uh, uh, sorry, uh, PD-1 inhibitors, which have, bec have become very fashionable nowadays? There are no, a number of studies, and I've just chose two here for you. One of them is the is the GVAC CRS207 plus minus nivolumab, and this is a randomized phase two, and another uh, phase one, two study, which is looking at uh, ipilimumab plus nivolumab together. So an area which is currently uh, moving, but a bit slowly in pancreatic cancer. 
And I took this opportunity, talking about uh, PD-1 inhibitors, to also uh, talk about BTK, targeting BTK. And as you know, it's been an effective uh, way of treating some of the uh, hematological malignancies. And at this point in time, uh, this is uh, coming into uh, treating patients with pancreatic cancer. And there are at least a couple of studies in the front line using two different agents, ACP196, and also ibrutinib, which is already approved by the FDA. And uh, the combinations with uh, chemotherapy here are in front line, gemsadium, not packed ataxel. Again, very interesting. But also interesting in the second line, there's a trial with the combination of ACP196 with the Pembrolizumab. And again, the reason for this is that uh, these agents can also uh, try to modify the immune status of the tumor, favoring uh, immune response. And uh, this is a long uh, discussion about this. I'm not really going into that. But it's something which is being also utilized in the context of uh, immune therapy and pancreatic cancer. So hopefully, we will see some signals here that can t be taken to a larger trial. Now, there was mention of the whole genome sequencing publication recently, but I'm just going to focus on what really uh, uh, I'm interested in as a clinician, which is can I get some information for treating my patients? And certainly the DNA repair defects and the, and the, and the genomic uh, uh, profiling of that is really becoming more important here. And you can see that uh, on, on, on your right, uh, uh, there, there are, uh, in, in green, uh, samples uh, in, from patients and also xenografts that really worked in terms of the successful treatment with, with, with drugs that will target the DNA deficient cells, such as platinum compounds. So from this uh, genome analysis, there was, again, a strong signal that, in my, in my opinion, it's a strong signal to support, at least support the beginning of uh, a more thorough work and investigation of using uh, a biomarkers which relate to DNA repair deficiency. And here I'm trying to not use the word P BRCA because I think it extends beyond B B BRCA. But sticking to BRCA itself, you can see that there is some evidence uh, from some work done uh, in England where they, they looked into patients who, are, who had BRCA mutations and they underwent treatment with platinum compounds and certainly patients who had the BRCA mutations did do better than, uh, than those who didn't. Into, uh, uh, sorry, the ones who got platinum did better. So platinum might be preferentially the drug you use, which makes sense in a situation where DNA repair may be deficient. And there's also a recent paper looking at olaparamid, which is a Olaparamid, which is a, um, a PARP inhibitor in patients who have BRCA mutations with different tumor types, including pancreatic cancer. And there's a, also a, a signal there a, a, or indication or suggestion that that might be another treatment uh, modality to go forward with. Now, moving forward, there are a few studies that are looking into, into use of um, platinum compounds and also uh, plus uh, uh, PARP inhibitors in patients with pancreatic cancer. But why, my, one of the things which I have to really highlight is that how do you select the patients and doing germline mutations of BRCA, you can do that from the lymphocytes. What about somatic mutations you look for? And one of the things about BRCA mutations from, for, somatic mutation, for somatic mutations, if you want to take a sample of the tumor, you have to be careful because you need enough of the DNA to do that. And sometimes the final aspirates we use, they don't really let enough uh, tissue to be tested for it. And, uh, and we're also embarking on a clinical trial at the Southwest Oncology Group where we're going to use the homologous recombination deficiency assay uh, uh, as we do a study with a PARP inhibitor. And the reason here is that although this assay has shown to be uh, probably working in patients with uh, breast cancer, we don't know how it will function in patients with pancreatic cancer. So that's an area which we're really uh, going to investigate. So uh, another a part of um, interesting work to do. Now, what about our old friend KRAS? And you heard Margaret saying that there's a, a large initiative to try to target RAS. And again, without boring you with the previous history of uh, targeting RAS using pharmacy transferases, which may not have been the right drugs to use, things failed, didn't work. It's been a very difficult uh, molecule or, target or, a, or a, a pathway to target. And again, there's a high frequency of mutations in this disease, which usually are in, well, almost always are in codon 12. Now, since I bring, brought up the KRAS, I wanted to really uh, go back in time and tell you about some studies that were done which were around the RAS pathway. So you have the EGFR, IGF-1R, which are proximal 
uh, to RAS, and, the, and you have a MEK inhibitor that was done, which is uh, downstream of RAS. And all these trials, and these trials here represent probably more than 2,000 patients, these were essentially a negative or a marginal benefit from erlotinib. And there's a, 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 and, and there's a reason probably because of the RAS mutations, but what about MEK, uh, MEK targeting MEK? Maybe that should have worked, but that's too simplistic. And therefore, we thought, well, if you, if you hit MEC, MEC and you go back and read the experiments done about hitting MEC in the, in the lab, there's this crosstalk with, with other pathways like AKT. And therefore, the blockade of MEC will be ineffective because the signaling will go through. AKT is still the cells will survive. And therefore, we decided to, to target both at the same time simultaneously, thinking that would be one way of doing a, a, a downstream of RAS inhibition. Unfortunately, as you can see here, the experimental arm did not do well. In fact, it did worse than the, what is the standard of care giving Folfox. It's in a second line trial, so, so we failed. And this also gives you a good idea of how you should be doing clinical trials because without selecting patients, without having maybe even more robust way of testing your hypothesis in the preclinical setting, certainly we need another, if we were to, uh, to, to target both, we certainly would have needed another drug here because there have, I'm sure we activated on other pathway. But again, do we go back to the lab now to try to, to, to seek that uh, other drug? I think it became questionable. One of the interesting things that are happening now is uh, targeting another pathway or, or a molecule which is downstream of uh, RAS and the PAC. And uh, this, is a, this is considered to be a choke point, uh, uh, so downstream of, of KRAS. And there were a number of drugs, and there's one drug in particular that was tested in the phase one uh, setting many years ago at Charing Cross Hospital, and it was dumped because of side effects. However, there's a new generation of uh, allosteric inhibitors that are being tested now. I can't give you more information, but in our institution, we're looking into, into them, and there is some uh, nice selectivity to the cancer cells. You can look at the, on the left and the right, and you compare the bars, and you can see that uh, with the normal appearing cells, it's not really doing anything to them. So this is work in progress, and hopefully there will be a drug coming to a phase one, maybe sometime in 2016. Now, I, I mentioned something about the uh, tumor suppressor genes, and certainly we have a, a, a significant number of patients with, uh, with tumors with high frequency of tumor suppressor gene mutations, uh, P16, P53, SMAT4, you heard about these old uh, mutations. I just want to focus on a drug called Selenexor, or KPD330, and this happens to be a small molecule that, that blocks a, 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 a protein which is on the nuclear membrane, not the cell membrane, nuclear membrane, which is a protein that pumps the tumor suppressor gene products out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Now, you want those products or proteins to stay in the nucleus. And, uh, and as a result, if you inhibit that, path, uh, that pump, then you can retain those in the nucleus and also lead to activation of the tumor suppressor gene uh, products. And this is a small molecule that uh, I can tell you that it has shown activity, clinical activity in some hematological malignancies. And we looked at it in our institution in pancreatic cancer, and there's some very nice uh, evidence that it really works, and, um, and it works with gemcitabine. We tested that also. We have a number of experiments done, mechanistic and otherwise. And this has gone now into a phase one, phase two clinical trial that currently is ongoing. Now, I just want to finish off by uh, some other studies that are currently being done. I didn't have time to explain the full details of why these are done. Just to give an example of the MM141, which is a HER3 and IGF1R inhibitor. So remember, the IGF1R studies were negative, and the idea with the HER3 is that you can overcome resistance to, uh, to the IGF1R inhibition. So that's uh, one study. Um, there are others, other uh, clinical trials ongoing. The NOTCH pathway, uh, uh, Dr. Hidalgo talked about, uh, stem cell uh, targeting, that's the hope. It's also ongoing. And as you can see that most of these, uh, in fact, all of the ones I'm seeing, showing on the slide, they're using the GEMNAP Paclitaxel platform. Whether that's right or wrong, I cannot answer that question, but certainly that's becoming more of the norm for a number of reasons, including regulatory, but also maybe the more, the easier, the ease of uh, combining the, 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 the new drugs with the GEMSAVNAP Paclitaxel. So just to conclude, 
uh, I would say pancreatic cancer remains a major unmet need. There is no part of uh, pancreatic cancer that is more unmet need than the other. We need new uh, ideas, strategies in all stages of the disease. And advances have been, generally speaking, with uh, or almost all, almost all of them in the cytotoxic therapies, but we need to have more in the target agents. And there are some hints of, um, of exciting areas to come ahead of us in the stroma direction, directed therapies, DNA repair deficient uh, tumors, and also immune modulation. Uh, we need to discover more biomarkers. We don't have biomarkers. We need to have more robust biomarkers. We have to focus on frontline therapies. In my opinion, if, we, if you look at what happened in colon cancer where the major survival advantages we see are really by getting better STEMI treatments up front. But at the same time, we should not forget about uh, patients with poor performance status or less favorable performance status. These are patients who currently are completely excluded from clinical trials, and they represent a fair number of patients compared to other uh, tumor types. And again, uh, clinical trials, we have to put patients on clinical trials, all stages of the disease. We may have patients who cannot go on clinical trials, but certainly they, be, they should be going. And it's a disease where, especially in the United States, we don't do that well uh, compared to the severity and the impact of the disease on, on health. And tissue ac acquisition is really very important because that's one of the things which also we don't do as well, partly because of the nature of the disease. But nowadays we're writing more protocols where we're doing research biopsies and these are really being accepted by patients. It's not that difficult. So we have to really uh, think about that as a routine. Well, with that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing my presentation. I know some of you feel tired by now, but I hope that I made at least the young people in, in the audience and older ones to be interested in really pursuing research and, uh, in this disease where it's a major challenge, but then again, that keeps us healthy and alive and young. Thank you.